Hello, my name is John David, and I am the writer, producer, and the performer of The Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles, and this is John David and Goliath. Welcome to episode two of John David and Goliath. And as you uh, have guessed from episode one, I have flung the rock at a Goliath. Goliath being the Northview Hotel group who runs the Boca Raton. They were horrible. In this episode, I'm going to talk about working at the Boca Raton salon, about my managers and the lies that they fed me. And why I stayed. It was insane why I stayed, but I was in up to my neck. And they are not the real Goliath. The real Goliath is working through my fear. What do I have to be afraid of? Well, I'm afraid of their lawyers. I'm afraid of being crushed or... It's scary because I'm doing something outside the box. I'm speaking up for my own rights. I'm speaking up for others who have been wronged by big companies because they have all the might and it makes us fearful and it makes us poor and it makes us poorer why they get richer and richer and it's just not right i'm over it i'm sick of it and i'm putting my foot down by doing this podcast so let me talk about fear for a minute i had to do a lot of spiritual work to get to this point to produce this podcast. And one of the things, uh, I read a lot of cool books, spiritual books or self-help books and different philosophies. Uh, I love that stuff because it keeps me sane. It keeps me thinking, well, what's this life all about? Is it about working and being happy all the time? Or is there something greater at play? And I think there's something greater at play. We're here to love and cherish each other, first and foremost, on this earth, and to remember that we're a soul and a body. And then when we pass, there's something better. So if you don't believe that, that's okay. You, you, you do you, but that's what I believe. So I think this is part of that for me. And I just read a book where it really showed me again what I already know to be true. I'm not the fear. I'm that soul that kind of knows I'm okay. I'm going to die. I'm going to pass the other side and there'll be a quote unquote heaven for me or a different dimension, a different reality. And I've had tons of experiences uh, with mediums or people who have passed, who have spoken through mediums to me or at me, letting me know, nope, we got your back. We're going to help you from the other side. Is there a God? Yes. Are there archangels helping you? Yes. They might not be benevolent beings, as you think, but that good energy is there available for us at all times. And I believe that. So I think my Goliath is my fear of forgetting that. My fear of what I'm doing right now scares me because of my past. Goliaths can come at me. People can come at me and hurt me. But really, can they? No. My soul's intact. It's backed up, and I'm just watching the fear from afar, basically. That's how I feel about it. I'm just watching what comes up. I'm fearful of doing things that are right. Well, why am I fearful of that? I shouldn't be. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to make it through. I've always had food on the table. I've always had a roof over my head. I've always made money. It's going to be fine. I'm just taking on a project, i.e. a corporation, a company that has wronged me and has wronged others, including their members and their guests and their customers, and cheated them out of good service, good employees, and cheating me out of a career. And I'm just presenting it to the world and saying, this is not right. I should not be afraid of that. But society is going, are you crazy? They're going to slam you with something. What are they going to slam me with? They can't kill me. They can't hurt my soul. So I'm working through that fear. That's what I'm doing here in this podcast and coming up against them, which is a Goliath. But it's no bigger a Goliath than my own Goliath inside of my heart. And that's the fear. So I'm walking through that, walking around it. I'm throwing stones at my own fear, but I'm dealing with it. 
So here we are. There is my little airy fairy thing. And if you want some advice for your fear, I say back up. Know that you're the soul in your body. You have nothing to be fearful of, per se. Your soul's intact. Back up and watch what you're doing with your fear. Where does that come from? Find out where it comes from, but watch it from afar. That's what I'm doing with my fear. So I guess that's advice. It's spiritual advice. That's what I'm doing. So in this episode, I'm going to tell you about working for the Boca Raton Resort. Welcome to... John David and Goliath. So I told you in the last episode how I really did my research, found out that the Boca Raton had so much buzz around it, around the world. The world knew that this uh, property that had five hotels and uh, less than 10 restaurants were opening at the beginning. It was going to be the creme de la creme of the company, North Rue Hotel Group, who was the management and the head company owning it, along with MSD Partners, which is Michael Dell's company that runs his billions. Um, they were the investing money into it. They were going to make this resort, the creme de la creme. They raised their, uh, membership rates for members from like 35,000 a year to a hundred grand. Plus they have a, a monthly fee, especially if you moor your boat there or, or whatever. And it gives them slight discounts, but not really, but they should be able to get, uh, first come, first serve of members to the pools and so forth, but they couldn't even do that. So those of you members listening, yeah, there's a reason why you couldn't get a reservation at the pool or a reservation at the restaurant or a salon appointment or a massage appointment or um, a facial appointment. There's a big reason. You see, when they were getting ready to open, <laughs> the company... Um, had a little problem. It's, it's almost laughable if, if I don't want to cry about it. It's laughable because it's so stupid that any company would have just floored up and died, just laid across the floor and died. And it, it's so stupid. They do not want this to come to the public. But before I get to that, let me just tell you about my experience working there and it'll come up. I'll tell you the problem. Ugh, I was supposed to work full time and make money, but they opened the property late. They were supposed to open in the fall, then pushed it back. And here I am, December 14th. Yay, I'm going to go to work. But the managers, the two female managers, one was the spa manager and under her is the salon manager. And they inform me that, oh, wait a minute, John David, the salon's not quite built yet. I'm going, not quite built yet. Well, where am I going to work if I'm going to work there? And they say, well, we have opened a salon suite. It's been open for a while. And the other hairdresser, hairdresser number one, I thought I was going to be the number one, is already working there. She is a holdout from when it was owned by the Waldorf Astoria. She has the full clientele, so she's booked up. She's working five days a week in a makeshift salon suite, which is one of the facial rooms. We've propped up a mirror. It's a stupid, ugly mirror. They didn't say that, but it is a stupid, ugly mirror. And we have put in our colors and our peroxides and our shampoos in a back bar that's really supposed to be a facial shelving unit, but we put all that stuff there. And you'll have to snatch a few towels from down in the basement and bring them up during every client. And you will have tepid water at best because we had to put in a sink that actually hooks to the faucet, which is made for washing hands and so forth in the salon suite which is really a facial room. They give me this room, but only two days a week, Sundays and Mondays, because hairdresser A has it five days a week. And I'm like, how long is that going to be? Any day now, you know, it's only going to be a matter of weeks. They say the salon's going to be done. And they told me the salon was going to be this state-of-the-art, new equipment. Just It was just going to be, hands down, the most beautiful salon in the world. 
And I believed him and I wanted to believe him because, you know, I moved there for this job in June of, in June of 2021. And I finally secured the job in the middle of summer in the fall. And they hired me officially around October. I go through these courses. They, they call them the Michelin courses because when the Waldorf Astoria sold to the Northwood Hotel Group, you become a new hotel. So all their five-star rating goes away. It's a new property and they have to earn that five-star rating. It can take years to get that five-star rating. But as a property, you really want to get to that five-star rating, Michelin rating, or it's four-star, I think it is. I think there's only four stars. They want the four stars. Anyway, they train us how how to treat customers in these these workshops. And nothing I learned there was new because I was in the salon industry and I was a consultant in the 90s. So I worked with the top spa consultants in the world. So it was pretty much in the salon industry, what we do anyway. But they teach you things like use the client's name three or four times, not their first name, but the Mrs. So-and-so, their last name, you know, two or three times. And if you come across a child and a parent walking through the halls and they stop you and make eye contact with you and you want to address a child, you want to get down on one knee. Again, it's kind of old fashioned, but it's really cool. And I love that about the Boca Raton. So I love that stuff. And I love uh, grace and and, uh, propriety. I just love it all. So that was cool. So I go in there and I'm working in this crappy salon suite and I'm doing my best as if it was my own kitchen where the hot water didn't work, but I have to do the client, make them happy. So I make them happy, all the clients that I'm doing, but two days a week and I'm really suffering because I should have been busy those two days a week, but I'm doing one client here, one client there. And really, I'm doing more employees for a few times here and there. I'm even doing the manager of the whole property. Each hotel has a hotel manager, but the manager of the whole place is my client. On his second appointment, I even ask him, I ask him point blank, I go, hey, Mr. Big Manager, why is it so slow? I don't understand. You have four hotels that opened out of five and 16% of those people booked should be booking into the salon and spa. Why aren't they booking with me? He goes, you are going to make a killing. You're the best hairdresser I ever had here. You're great. Love you. In my mind, I'm thinking, the reason I took this job at the Boca Raton was I don't have to walk into a hair salon and stand around and do a lot of Instagram stuff to build a clientele. They already have the clientele. Plus, they have returning guests. Uh, they have returning uh, members. They have returning people that all around the area uh, used to go to that salon were going to return. At least a percentage of them were when it was going to open. But I was seeing none of those people. I'm standing around eight hours a day, pretty much doing nothing in this shitty, awful salon suite. Ugh. And you have to wear a mask and the windows are open. It's it's just terrible. So he says, no, no, you're going to build up. Don't worry. And I'm thinking, well, I don't like the sound of that because it sounds like I have to build a clientele for on my own. So I'm thinking, oh, I got to do promotions. I know how to do that, whatever. But then I also go to the spa manager and I ask her, she goes, oh no, it's as soon as the salon's open, you're going to make a killing. The customers love you. The employees that you've done love you. You're just one of the best hairdressers I've ever had. Hairdresser A had a sick week and she was out with COVID and I replaced her that week. And I wasn't very busy even doing her clients. Some of them rebooked with her another week, but um, the clients I did, you know, they were great. And I wasn't that busy. I was still standing around six hours or five hours a day doing nothing out of eight hours. So I get the paycheck from whence I worked for hairdresser A when she was out with COVID. And it was pretty good, I have to say. But it is a couple weeks into January, and I realized that 
I only have from January of 2022 at this point to June of 2022 to build a clientele in Florida. I really thought the Boca Raton was going to be it. I had moved there specifically to land a job here, which I did, and to work there because it's beautiful. It's a beautiful property. It's on the beach. I got my apartment right next to it that was affordable, almost the same as I was paying in Chicago for a one bedroom. I got a two bedroom with balconies and new furniture. I really had banked on the Boca Raton, but it wasn't panning out. It wasn't busy. And yet this paycheck was pretty good, but I decided I better cut my losses. I better start working somewhere else where I still have a chance to build a clientele in the busy season. Because when slow season comes in June, when all the snowbirds go away, it was going to die down and I was going to be, you know, it's just not a good time to be a hairdresser, especially your first year of building. Again, I didn't think I had to build at the Boca Raton because they had four hotels. I should be busy. And that was the problem. Hello, dear listeners. In the future, I may have to have a GoFundMe page to raise money for lawyers, but right now I am asking you to support me and support this podcast by purchasing my books in paperback or ebook at amazon.com or ebooks at barnesandnoble.com. Mafia Hairdresser is based on my time in LA when I was a private hairdresser to a cocaine trafficking couple and a very well-known Chicago mobster in the 80s. The Glowstick Gods, the sequel to Mafia Hairdresser, is about the 90s when I was an A-list party boy and I traveled around the world chasing the best raves and parties while observing the demise of the entire scene when crystal meth came into being. And if you'd rather listen to my fabulously dangerous life instead of reading about it, you can just listen to season one and season two of this podcast, The Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles. Just go all the way to the beginning. And season three will be out in 2024. That's 2024. Hey, thanks for listening. So I go to the salon manager and I say, hey, salon manager, I do not think this is working out. And she says, hey, did you notice that paycheck? And I said, yes, I did. She goes, well, doesn't that show you how much money you can make? You were hardly busy, and yet that paycheck was so big. I go, yeah, it really was. It was very encouraging. She goes, plus this lawn's going to open any day. Uh, so I stuck it out some more. And then the salon did open. But you know what? The salon wasn't anything. It wasn't beautiful. It was just this big, large room. The entranceway was still a wall because it they had to build out a store on the other side that was in the cloister. The cloister is a big hotel. It so used to be pink, then they painted it back the original white. And it's just beautiful. Some of the rooms had been renovated. I'd seen those because I'd worked uh, in some of people's rooms, which was great. That was good money, but I didn't do enough of that. And the shampoo bowls, I have to say, were state of the art. They were the best, the bomb diggity. You would just sit in them and the chair would just relax you, push you into the shampoo bowl. And no one ever complained about their neck hurting. It was they're great, the, the shampoo bowls. But the cupboards they put in were just nothing to write home about. They weren't state-of-the-art uh, infrared lights or anything like that. There was no mats on the floor. I had ruined my feet by wearing nice shoes to work. I had to stop doing that because no mats on the floor means so cushion. Even if you're doing one or two clients a day, it's still too hard on your feet and your back. Um, the manicure stations were just long rows of formica um, countertops that are uh, acetone resistant, but nothing, no big deal. With the, They had the shields up at the time because it was still pandemic-ish land. And the pedicure bowls chairs were just the worst. They are old and decrepit, and they just put in the old ones back. I know that they were probably ordering new ones, but when we opened it wasn't like that they used to have windows in the salon and then they put in no windows just very few portal windows into a little garden area between the spa and the salon but really the salon just looked like the ugly stepchild 
to the spa. Nothing was beautiful about it. The reception desk isn't in the salon. It's in the spa. They booked us. And we also had a, a, a phone room where we were supposed to have our own little operators that would work full time to book us as well. But they were never busy. The phones never rang. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. <laughs> So the salon opened and I wasn't busy and I decide I'm not going to be happy. Plus, I had been taken a meeting with the spa manager and she says, oh, remember that paycheck that? Oh, yeah, the good one. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, well, we overpaid you, so you have to pay back half of it. Great. <laughs> So I decide I'm going to quit. So I tell that spa manager I have to quit. This is not happening for me. And she says, JD, we love you. You're a great hairdresser. You're going to be so busy. It just is going to take some time with this, the salon. It just newly opened. And um, I didn't tell her I thought it was ugly, but that's that. And the break room. Oh, my God. There's no break room for this sp- st- staff. It's a makeshift room that's with old cupboards with the color in it and a crappy, rusty sink. And there's a shutter that is for trash cans. It's really a trash room. It's not even a color lab room. It's dank and dark. It's gross. And that's when we're supposed to hang out between clients. So ugly and shitty. So subpar. Um, may no client walk into there. And the bathroom's old, too, and they slapsticked it as well. It's just not a good, great salon. Sorry. But the spas are great. The spa room for the facialists and the massage therapists, they're great. But, again, for the manicurists, pedicurists, and the salon people, shitty, shitty, shitty. And they made a stupid cupboard for to put our products in because they didn't want our products to be out. But either way, I would have stayed just to have the clientele and to be busy and that wasn't happening. And she begged me to stay and she says, you're going to be busy and just, just hold off. And I said, I will hold off a few more weeks. You say we're going to be busy. We just opened the hair salon. I'm giving back my paycheck. I really am only all in because of all the things I told you. I moved there for this job. I was so scared. I, it was failing. And I, I, just wanted it to work out. Well, it got slower and slower. And then they allowed me to work six hour days instead of eight hour days because I was going crazy. And then one day, it was about April 12th, I think it was. One of my clients comes in and she says, JD, I just want to tell you that I can't make my appointment. She comes at 1130. It's on a Monday or Sunday. And she says, I just like you so much. I just didn't want you standing around thinking I wasn't going to come in. I said, well, why didn't you just call? She goes, well, I couldn't get through. I said, well, I was just at the reception desk and I was also in the salon and spa call center and the phones aren't ringing at all. The girls had plenty of phone time. Plus, you know, where there's computers, they'll put you on hold. They, you won't drop your calls She goes, well, my calls are dropped. I couldn't get through. And the concierge was telling me to email you. And like, the concierge, why are you getting a concierge? Why aren't you directly to the salon? She goes, I don't know how it works. And so she left. And um, I was thankful that she came in and told me I was going to be standing around at 1230 because she couldn't call and cancel. Now, here's another thing I just want to add. I was paid so much money for clients that never showed up. You see, the Boca Raton has a policy that when members or people book and they don't cancel within 24 hours, they'll take all your money and they'll pay the hairdresser and they'll keep the other portion too. You don't get a refund if you don't call 24 hours in advance. And I brought this up to my salon manager and she says, oh, that's the way rich people are. They don't care about their money that, that much. And this is a sentiment she also stated um, many times to the rest of the staff in our salon morning meetings when we would be told how many people are booked up at the hotels and what what we should be ready for, which 
uh, we never got busy from the hotels. And there's a reason for that, and that has to do with the phones. I know you're, you're getting close to knowing what I know. So I find out that this woman couldn't call and cancel her reservations. I'm starting to understand why I got paid so much from clients who didn't show up. I think they actually did try and cancel the, or move their appointments 24 hours in advance, but they couldn't. And they were frustrated about that, but they didn't know why they couldn't reach the hair salon. And I don't know why the clients can't reach the hair salon. So what I did was I went to the front desk. I said, do not charge this woman, uh, my client, for her appointment. And they told me several times, even through emails afterwards, that they w- they would pay me anyway. I, again, it's not about the money. It was just about standing around doing nothing. And I don't want to, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of for the client. So I went to HR and I said, what is up phones? Like, I don't understand. I was just in the call center in the salon and the reception desk in the spa. There's no one calling. And yet my client said she couldn't get in. She goes, oh, that's because when the Walter Vistoria sold the property with the five hotels and all the restaurants and the golf and all the pools and all the yacht club and the, and the beach club, With all of these things going on, they had taken their phone server out and the new company, which is Northview Hotel Group and MSD Partners, which includes the money of Michael Dell, a big tech company, um, they put in a new phone server. But the transition manager, uh, technical transition manager, she said, when he did his inspection, he should have caught that, but he didn't. When you put in a new phone server, it needed fiber optics. So this is why they opened so late. It's because they didn't have a phone system. And this is why the hair salon, which was on the the bottom of the ranking for the operators that they hired to handle what a server or a machine or a computer should have been doing, it was manually being done by all these new operators and concierge that were being paid to route the calls. Well, the salon and spa are the lowest because there's one hairdresser and four manicurists. Again, they have to have second jobs to make ends meet as well as I did. The reason was is because the clients couldn't reach to book us. Now, when you're hired as a manicurist or a hairdresser to a salon, you assume that the phones are working, but not here. No, this is a place where they hired all these people to work in the restaurant on tips or the salon and spa who work on commission and tips. And we did not have a working phone. We had a phone server that required fiber optics and it was going to take a year to retrofit it. So they had started digging up about the spring putting in a trunk line for fiber optics from the street into the Boca Raton. Well, that was going to take months. Plus, they had to reroute reroute every wire with fiber optics throughout the whole system. It's hard to retrofit an old, old property like the Boca Raton anyway. But to do that with the wiring for every phone line is absolutely astronomically near to impossible to do overnight. The managers knew this and lied to me every time I brought up why and asked why directly. They point blank to my point blank question, lied to me every step of the way, including the manager of the whole property. When I asked him directly why I wasn't so busy, he lied and says, you will be busy. He knew that I couldn't be booked up because the phone lines were down and he didn't tell me. The manager The salon manager and the spa manager lied to me directly saying, you're going to be so booked up. Uh, One of the times I went to quit, they said, oh, you're going to be so booked up because we're booking groups. And when groups book, they want their hair done. You know what? I don't think I got one or two clients out of that, out of all the groups that they started booking. And the reason is when those groups booked into the uh, hotels and they picked up the phone and they tried to reach the hair salon. This is what they were asked to do. Would you email the hair salon to book an appointment? And they're like, no. 
and they did not book through email. Because any client knows if you try and book something through email and you need to change your appointment or cancel it, you it's impossible. And if you saw that policy on your email, if you don't cancel within 24 hours, you're screwed, you're, you're out of there. You book a hair appointment or a nail appointment through your phone. So there you have it. There's the reason why the Boca Raton salon failed so miserably for me in the first year. Now, let me tell you why I didn't quit. It was April. I had basically the end of April and May to build a clientele somewhere else if I quit. I was all in in this property. I thought if I stuck it out, the loyalty back and forth from me to the salon and spa manager and vice versa, We, if I got through this and they did fix the phone lines soon enough or they could get me clients soon enough, I could survive and still make a great amount of money in the next six years working for this company. I had to be. I was being hopeful. I was felt strapped to it um, emotionally. I just couldn't quit. So that's the story so far. But I have so many more months from that April 12th day where I discovered that the phone lines were down. And that is why I was standing around doing nothing. Um, I had experienced so much more after that period because I stayed, I worked it out with the managers, I made a deal with them and they broke that with me, that deal and lied as well. And there's just so much more to the story. I'm going to tell you about that in the next episode. I'll tell you the deal I made with the devil, the devil being the managers and the powers that be at the Boca Raton Salon and Spa and the Boca Raton LLC. I'll tell you the mandate that the upper management made that made a huge uh, impact on many other employees' lives at the Boca Raton. There were walkouts. There were people quitting all the time. And the reason is um, the decisions that the upper management made crushed these people's careers and souls. I would have left had I been younger and felt like I could just move on and get another job. But I, I'm now 60. I can't just up and move and get another job. It's not like I want to um, go back in that race with other people. This was the dream job. This was perfect. I didn't have to build a clientele per se by myself. And um, they just ruined that career. They ruined my whole Florida career as a hairdresser. So I will save that rant and rave for the next episode of John David and Goliath.